So thank you all for joining us. Again, I am Carrie Martinez with Sales Gravy, and I'm your host for today. The topic for, our, for this webinar series is the triple threat, dramatically improve response rate using phone, email, and social media. Our guest speaker is Josiane Fagan. Also joining us are two Verizon representatives, Victoria Boston and Kim Avery. We'll start off our webinar with a word from each of our Verizon guests, and I'd like to first introduce Victoria Boston. Vicki is a Vice President of the Northeast Area Customer Service for Verizon, which is the largest wireless provider in the country and a premier technology company with the greatest 4G coverage. She's responsible for, for leading 5,000 customer professionals, customer service rep professionals located across 10 company-owned and operated customer service contact centers. Prior to her current position, Vicki was director of retail stores for Verizon in Virginia, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. She's been with the company for 24 years. We have Kim Avery. She's worked for Verizon for over 14 years, starting her career in 1999 as a customer service representative. Since then, she's worked across all corners of the business, advancing into numerous leadership roles. Kim currently holds the role of director at the Wilmington, North Carolina Contact Center, which employs over 650 representatives providing customer service and technical support assistance to Verizon customers throughout the nation. So, Vicki, would you like to start us off? Okay, I would love to. Thank you so much. And uh, welcome, everybody, to Sales Gravy. And I'm excited uh, myself to hear from Josiane to talk about the triple threat. So when I think about the various roles I've had and the time I've been in sales and service, it really goes hand in hand, providing that total solution, which Kim will talk to in a second. But the thing that I want to hit on is that relationships matter and that our response time to our customers is mission critical because if I'm not in front of the customer, my competitor is. And it is so important that we stay relevant and we constantly provide that value proposition. And, a, you know, when you think about right now in today's environment, growth is slowing. I know in the wireless industry it's very saturated. I think everybody, including six-year-olds now, have smartphones. And so when you think about that, growth is slowing and it is mission critical to retain the embedded base so that you can go deeper into the account. So I'm excited to hear about what Josiane is going to share today as part of the triple threat. So with that, I will turn it over to Kim. Thanks. Thank you, Vicki. Hello, Thank everyone. You. Thanks. Hello, everyone. So glad to be here today to be a part of uh, this discussion. Uh, when I think about sales, uh, you can't have sales without having service, right? And the total customer experience, and that's what my journey throughout Verizon has been uh, all about is absolutely we are in the business of selling cellular service, but we know we only gain customers and coverage through just the service that we provide. At the end of the day, um, our customers uh, stay with us because they know they can have a reliable service with us, and also that they, when they call in with a problem that it can get corrected. Um, so, you know, the biggest piece is just securing the sale and understand the total customer uh, experience and how um, customers share. They share experiences. When they have a good experience with a company, they share that. And when they don't, um, no one's going um, off, uh, you know, do I like this product? A lot of us are going online, reviewing uh, reviews about products. So the experience is so critical in terms of the uh, growth of a company. So I'm interested as well in, in hearing the details. And with that, Carrie, I will turn it back over to you. Way. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, as you all know, we have Josiane Fagan with us today. Uh, she is the author of Smart Selling on the Phone and Online, and she's got a new book out called Smart Sales Manager. She's a pioneer, maverick, and visionary in the inside sales community. She's a 20-year veteran of the industry, and Josiane is the founder of Telesmart Communications. Since 1994, the San Francisco-based solutions provider has been a leader in developing global inside sales teams and managers. For the past two decades, she has combined her sales and marketing talents in building a brand. Josiane has trained thousands of salespeople and certified hundreds of managers on her Telesmart 10 system, carving a niche with some of the most talented and progressive Fortune 1000 high-tech companies in the world. Welcome, Josiane. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much, Carrie. It's really great to be here, and it is fantastic to partner with Verizon. I must say I'm a Verizon wireless user myself. I have persuaded and convinced many people that have dropped calls with other providers to 
jump on the Verizon bandwagon. So it's really a pleasure to partner with everyone today. Well, you know, my, my, my new book, uh, Smart Sales Manager, really focuses on a lot of new ways to uh, manage teams and especially a lot of new ways to communicate. And today's program especially is going to focus on what's, what's this new landscape out there? What does that look like, especially from a sales perspective? And what are some things that we need to perhaps refresh uh, that are really no longer working? And then introduce my what I call the triple threat, which really increases responses when you are reaching out in prospecting efforts and maybe talk a little bit about uh, what the future holds in, in terms of sales right now. So I guess I want to start with one area, one slide that is so, so important, and that is that the first impression. You know, the first impression actually accounts for more than 80% of the entire sale. And getting that first impression right, and we all know that. We know that the minute you meet someone, you have that first impression, that opinion of that person immediately, and it never really leaves you. And that's a lot of what happens on first impressions when we're on the phone and on email is the, that, that first impression. So my goal is to talk about this first impression and how we can make it a whole lot better. Some other statistics are that uh, connect rates on the phone continue to drop. Certainly Verizon, being a provider, understands that. But when we're reaching out to prospects, if we're making maybe 30 outbound calls a day, our connect rates with those 30 attempts is maybe, maybe at the most, you know, we may get maybe two people live. So the days of people answering their phones are really gone, and they're, they're diminishing. And so connect rates continue to drop. But once you finally get on the phone with someone, you're lucky if you can get at least two minutes. That's the most you can get. So we're having a lot of shorter conversations. And then in, in those conversations, the amount of time it takes to form a first impression uh, on the phone is like seven seconds or less. On email, it's maybe less than three seconds. Face-to-face, -face, it's a little more only because there's a lot more visual clues that we have that we can size up. So just to understand, you know, we're working with very, very limited, uh, you know, capacity here in this first impression. So we know that messaging is changing. You know, in, in the beginning, it was just the phone that was king. We could use the phone. We'd get through to people. And, and that's, that's starting to die a slow death. And we're seeing, you know, texting is coming along. Video is coming along. Uh, there's a lot more in the messaging channel than ever before. So messaging is really changing, and especially because our customers are changing more and more. Now, in my book, uh, I talk about what I call the new normal. And what I put together is what I call an ecosystem. And this ecosystem includes four components. Uh, the first component is the customer. We have a very different customer. Um, I'm not sure if it was Vicki or Kim, but one of you have been at Verizon for 25 years. Uh, that customer has completely changed since they were the customer 25 years ago. And people that have been in the sales world for years realize this is really a different customer. Uh, it's a much more independent customer. Uh, they're, they're socially savvy. We also have a lot of different talent, uh, especially this millennial talent that is going to really dominate our workforce by the year 2020. They're going to be about 75% of our workforce. Uh, we also have more tools. And that has changed the face of prospecting. So this ecosystem is really what influences us as we're selling, is we want to keep that in mind. So as I spoke about this customer, I call this customer the elusive customer. They're the customer that says, 
don't bother me, I can do all this shopping on my own. We're also seeing that this customer comes to us much later in the sales cycle than they ever did. They come to us much later, they've done a lot of their research, they've self-educated, and when they come to us they usually know what they want and, and what they want to buy. So it's actually a tough customer really to predict and to sell to because they are so independent. Some other uh, sort of qualities or characteristics of this customer is they travel light, meaning they don't want a lot of research, they don't want long email, uh, they like to shop on their own, they don't want to take risks. Uh, we are just coming out of some heavy, heavy, you know, recession areas, so they really don't want to take many risks. They have a short attention span. They're big social networkers. Uh, they have short fuses. That means they can get really upset and they can leave. Uh, they do their own research. They love to collaborate and they're not predictable. So all of these qualities, some of you may be agreeing, oh yeah, this sounds like the kind of customer I have. But it's important for us to understand this customer, especially as we have to change up some of our sales efforts to really align with this customer. The next part is tools, and that's uh, sort of included in that ecosystem. But tools have become so important now. And what I mean by tools is, you know, before we maybe we just had a phone and we had a road of decks or yellow pages, and those were our tools. But now there's a tremendous amount of uh, investment made in the sales process with tools. And I almost think that some of these tools are replacing the conversation. In other words, their sales productivity tools, their sales intelligence tools tools and their social media tools. And you know the, the amount of tools that we utilize now uh, to really make the sale happen. And what I mean by that is, for example, a CRM tool is a customer relationship management tool. Uh, a popular one is Salesforce. That's a CRM tool. Now you know you're calling prospects and you want to keep them you know in, in a database. Um, then sales intelligence, when you call on someone, you want to be knowledgeable and smart. Otherwise, they don't want to talk to you. And then certainly social media tools, the most popular one is LinkedIn. So we need to realize that not only are these tools a big part of the sales process, but also having a high tool IQ becomes important. In other words, if someone is looking for a sales position, it's really, really important for them to know tools, to have that on their resume, because that makes them very, very marketable in their role. And all of this certainly changes the face of prospecting, because what I call uh, the new sales superhero, today their prospecting is more about engagement, education, mobilization, collaboration, application. So, you know, we're really seeing a very different sort of sales success story than we did years ago. Uh, the, a, a, a sales sort of warrior or superhero has very different qualities. Before they may just only needed to have a good personality, and now there's so much more that's required. But I think it's important for us to realize where we've come from and what has expired, uh, what is really no longer working anymore. Uh, for example, some of you may remember we used to call in the old days and uh, we would talk to a, a, an operator, a PBX operator, who would put our calls through. And uh, then when we would go to the operator or whatever, we'd try and call someone, we'd get a live receptionist or a live executive assistant who would also talk to us or maybe not talk to us, screen the call, but at least they got on the phone and they talked. And then, oh boy, look at this. Now the phone, has, it's not that it's dead and it's gone and it's disappeared, but we're really finding voicemail is starting to die a slow death. Uh, many people, even on their cell phones, I always challenge this in my training, and I say, how many of you listen to your voicemail on your cell phone? And more than half of the group will say, I, I won't even listen to my voicemail messages. So um, voicemail is starting to, to fall, but we have you know something that's going to help. We're also noticing 
email response rates are dropping as well. Uh, because social media has become so significant, we're really seeing that most people are using that means for a higher response. And when I talk about social media, as I mentioned earlier, you know, LinkedIn is the primary form of social media, especially in the corporate world. But certainly we have everything from blogging to Twitter to YouTube to Facebook. You know, we have a lot of different, you know, social media avenues to, to reach out now uh, and get faster response certainly through Twitter, through LinkedIn. Uh, and, you know, here's some of the statistics we're seeing, you know, in terms of LinkedIn that's growing and tripling on a daily basis. We're really finding that, you know, that the buyer-seller interactions are really happening online. And video is really, you know, stepping up and, and taking a much stronger stance. We're also seeing that smartphones, I mean, everybody, everybody has a smartphone these days. Uh, and certainly because we're with Verizon, we're, we're all promoting that. Uh, but we're really seeing that the statistics where people need to look, utilize their smartphones for just about everything. So we need to really think that when we reach out, we've got to think you know, we're reaching out through that medium more than anything. So I want to introduce everybody to this triple threat and, and sort of explain what this triple threat is about. Uh, you know, voicemail can no longer stand on its own. It's not that it's dying, but it just can't stand alone. Many, many years ago, I probably made a lot of money doing voicemail seminars all day long. How to leave that perfect voicemail, when to leave it, how often, uh, but that's not happening as much. And it, in other words, it's not happening alone. Uh, what it really needs now is a friend, which I call email. And in, for quite a while, I called them the dynamic duo. You know, they were sort of joined at the hip. So what I mean by that is these two need to be synchronized always at the same time. But now there's a new component that increases the results, and that's the social. So this triple threat now suggests that when we're making these outreach efforts, we really work with all three of these simultaneously at the same time to really get a higher response. And so I'll explain what I mean in more detail. So when we look at this slide, I know there's uh, quite a bit to this slide. It's a little busy of a slide. but. This slide really looks at both phone and email. And it says, you know, they have a lot of the same characteristics. For example, there's tone when you're on the phone and on email. There's also word choice. There's pacing and there's organization. So what do I mean by tone? Well, certainly we know that when you're on the phone, the tone that you want to shoot for is an energetic tone, an approachable tone, a professional tone, an authoritative tone. We know how important that first impression is over the phone based on the tone. We know that uh, if someone calls and they have, you know, they have a, a really flat tone, a monotone, or uh, their voice isn't as engaging, they're going to lose, you know, they won't capture attention like they will if they have a stronger tone. We know that someone that has an interesting voice, that has a really good authoritative voice, is going to get a lot farther on the call than someone that doesn't have that. But there's also tone on email. And tone on email, as you all know, you know, it could be caps. It looks like you're yelling. Uh, it could be exclamation marks. It looks like you're friendly. Uh, but emails definitely have a tone. And I highly suggest that everybody you know, glance at their emails to look at hey, what kind of tone am I communicating in my email. And then there's the word choice piece. Now, word choice is very important. Obviously, when we're speaking, we want to stay away from the non-words, the ones that are like um, um, uh, uh. Those are words that aren't going anywhere. Or acronyms. 
We also want to watch for weak words when we're speaking. Weak words sound like I'm trying, I'm wondering, I've been unsuccessful in reaching you. Those are all weak words. And again, that's someone's going to form a first impression, you know, just by your word choice. But also on email, you know, looking at stronger, more direct words. Um, and certainly the spelling and the grammar on email is important. So as we continue just to realize that the importance of all of these working together, the phone and email really work together. So for example, here is a sample of these two being delivered together. So what I highly recommend is a lot of people will put together uh, an email and it might be exactly what they said in their voicemail. But now, because I suggest that these two really happen at the same time, and when I mean at the same time, I literally mean that while you are you know, leaving a voicemail, you're pressing the send key. That's how synchronized these efforts have to be. Not in a situation where you say, oh, okay, I'm going to make all these voicemail messages uh, and then I'll send emails at the end of the day. The reason I say that these two must happen together is that I'm a firm believer that the majority of our prospects are actually there when you call. And they look over at, you know, caller ID and they say, oh, that's a vendor. Uh, I don't want to get that but they will immediately look at their screen on their laptop or their computer or their monitor and they're going to immediately look for that email. That's how we are programmed now. We're, we can't get one without the other. So if we're going to get both together, why not design these to complement each other? In other words, I don't need to say the exact same thing on my voicemail as I'm saying on my email. Uh, we now can change it up. We now can use voicemail as you know, a friendly greeting, uh, referring that they are going to be reaching uh, them by email, or vice versa. So you know, this is a time where I invite everybody to start thinking about their outreach effort when both of these are combined, and really spend more time sort of complementing each other. Um, here is a great example of how this can work. Now, th if you notice on this slide, it says, OK, the triple thread is voicemail, email, and social media, meaning primarily LinkedIn. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting for all new prospects that we go ahead and send them a LinkedIn invite, but I am suggesting with a lot of existing prospects or current partners that they do get a LinkedIn invite. because. The LinkedIn has become so strong in the business world that oftentimes when we cannot reach someone on email or they're not responding, if we go through the social channels, they'll respond a lot faster. I mean, that's been happening for quite a while uh, with me. I, I can't get the email response. I run through LinkedIn and I get a response immediately. Again, it's that customer 2.0 that's much more responsive to the social channels. So this is an example of a LinkedIn invite. This is a, a client of mine. But basically, the reason I like using that is it's showing that you can customize it. You can come in and say, you know, I'm really excited to speak with you, or I'm glad we've decided to move forward on this. You know, it can be customized. Uh, there's a generic sort of, hi, I want to add you to my network on LinkedIn. But I highly recommend that people take the time to really um, to really customize it. Now many of you have heard me say synchronize these, synchronize them, make them all work together. And I, I do mean that because we only have that first, you know, those first few seconds in that first impression. So why not come in with sort of a triple pow, you know, uh, as opposed to just one message in the morning and then another email in the afternoon. So when I say synchronize, I, I mean not only synchronize by time, but synchronize by messaging. In other words, make sure that you've got you know, that vocal stamp and the written stamp and the social stamp that all really align with each other uh, and certainly are synchronized with each other so they work together and someone can get a good feel for you. 
And many people still, um, if they're having trouble putting their email, I'm sorry, their voicemail together, these are just a few tips about voicemail. Uh, voicemail messages are getting shorter and shorter. I highly don't recommend that we leave voicemails uh, more than three over a several month period. In other words, too many voicemails are really not a great idea. But having one really good one is going to go a long way. And when you do put together a voicemail, make sure it's organized, uh, plan the message, have a clear objective, speak in a conversational tone, sound enthusiastic, give them the value. Uh, always say the phone number at the end, maybe once, but slowly. And it's got to be under 30 seconds. And it's really, you know, the who, what, the, the who and why are you calling, you know, what's in it for me. Uh, but again, it, it doesn't need to be very complicated, very wordy at all. What we really want voicemail for now is to complement your email efforts, your social efforts, and especially to really give people a, a sample of your vocal stamp. What do you sound like on the phone? And that's so, so important in voicemail. Um, you know, Subject lines or subject headings are tremendously important now, more than ever. Think about it. If we have a smartphone, what do we look at right away? We look at subject line, subject line, subject line. And that is a skill that I must say is underutilized. Uh, I could easily spend two days doing a training in my sessions on just writing subject lines. Um, some people get really nervous with subject headings where they make them way too long or they wait, make them way too vague. But one example that I have in my first book is to use a formula that says always take the name of your company on the same line, the name of the prospect company. And these two are married on the subject line. Why? Because it's really easy to reference it if you ever can't find that email. But also, it sort of subconsciously uh, suggests that there's a partnership that's already taken place. So this is a great way to put together you know, uh, a subject heading that you know, has already that partnership. Uh, also put an action verb in the center or in the middle to, to create more. Uh, people that have hard time with subject lines, I usually suggest a couple things. One, I, I suggest that they get really comfortable reading headlines. Uh, for them to start reading headlines in the news, whether it's Huffington Post or the Yahoo page or whether the New York Times or whatever they can do, but read headlines because obviously we know from a reporter standpoint that anyone that's in journalism knows that you know they have to distill thousands of words for a headline, and they can only have four or five words. So the better people can get at subject lines, the more important it's going to be. And also, um, another great way to get good at writing subject headings is to write the entire email first, and then grab a line or grab a, a sentence or part of a sentence and use that as the subject line. So these are little tricks, but certainly, you know, for teams that work all together, I, I train a lot of teams where there's, you know, 70 people in the team or a few hundred people. Um, this is a fantastic way when there's a lot of people on teams to start sharing subject headings for people to say, hey, you know, um, did you get response on this? Or this is a subject line I use all the time. I always get response. So it always collects some new ideas. And, and in the subject of collecting new ideas, uh, I highly recommend that we, we design an email template library. And I'll explain what that is. And that is that this is really part of your toolkit. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, 
the voicemail and email need to be synchronized. Uh, but it is also important to have, you know, emails that have different purposes. You know, whether you have an email that's a good email for a webinar download, or, or, or I'm sorry, a white paper download, or one for webinar attending, or one that's just an introductory email, or one that's a general information email. Uh, I highly recommend that people take their time to put these emails together. Now, the good news on a lot of these emails is they don't have to be as long as they used to be at all. Emails are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. The maximum email length we want to see is maybe two paragraphs. Anything more than that is not going to be read. So in terms of first impression, you know, oftentimes, sometimes on first impressions, someone will leave a very long voicemail message, and they'll follow it up with a very long email. Well, right away, that customer who's super busy and they have very short attention spans, they hear a long voicemail or they delete it pretty quickly and they look at this long email and to them they immediately form an opinion in their mind based on just these two things that hit their inbox or their voicemail and they go, I'm not going to work with this rep because this rep is going to soak up so much of my time. But they make this sort of preconceived judgment based on what they just received. And this is exactly what's happening when I say first impression and the triple threat is they're forming an opinion about you the minute they hear your voice and they see that email. So that's why we want to really synchronize it and brand it so they get a consistently strong you know, outreach in the first impression. And that's why building an email template library is so important is saying, OK, I want a good first attempt, second attempt, third attempt. Another reason why we want to have first, second, and third is you know, we're finding statistics where uh, the customer will usually come in and buy sometimes after the ninth attempt. However, a lot of salespeople are giving up somewhere around the fourth attempt. So we really need to align some of that a little better. But also when I talk about first attempt, second attempt, third attempt, what I mean is, let's say I'm trying to reach out to a prospect and I leave them a voicemail and send them an email. Then a couple days later, I do it again. Well, I don't want to send them that exact same email. And then let's say I do it again a few days later or the next week. Again, the third email, I don't want it to be the exact same one. So what I'm suggesting here is that we design uh, emails that are different, the first attempt, second attempt, third attempt. Now the third attempt, or before you close the lead, or last attempt, this is one that is getting actually quite wonderful response. It's getting very high response rate. And the reason I say that is this customer, the one that's super busy and really distracted and barely gives you your, their time, they're actually a customer that's motivated by fear. Um, they're a customer that doesn't want to feel left out. So many people on the third attempt email, what some of them are doing is they're putting a subject line that will say something like, still interested with a question mark. and this the uh, meat of the email will say, you know, Bob, I've tried reaching you a few times. Uh, I'm, understand I, I'm going to assume that our solution is not of interest to you, and I will close this lead out. And this is the one that gets high response, because what this Bob customer will do is either come back immediately and say, wait, 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 I've been busy, but I am interested. Please keep me on your radar. Or they'll say, yes, you're right, I'm not interested. But how wonderful to have you know, something as direct and as strong that says, are you in or are you out, and get a response. And so that third attempt strategy is really working for exactly that reason. Now a few email tips to just review as, as we've talked about voicemail tips is 
when we're, we really want to start thinking a lot like marketing. We know that in this new sales 2.0 world, salespeople are putting their marketing hats on. They're starting to really think about response rates, open rates, having good subject lines, something that was maybe uh, something that the marketing organization dealt with now is being considered uh, primary for the salespeople. Uh, we also want to make sure in an email that the opening sentence is just as important as the subject line. It's got to really be punched out strong. Um, one pet peeve I have of an opening sentence that people do is they'll say, hi, my name is Bob Smith. And I say, why are you taking that first sentence to say someone your name when we already know from the from field and the signature line that that's who you are? So we wanted to start with a much stronger punch opening, such as perfect timing for our solution or thank you so much, anything that you know comes with the direct, the positive. We also want to choose some strong words when we're leaving, uh, when we're writing our emails. Uh, certainly format it. As I mentioned earlier, no more than two paragraphs in length. Uh, we don't want to add a lot of attachments. We want to have, you know, hyperlinks uh, and with an action step. Our signature line should be short, no more than six lines. Uh, last point here, again, is very interesting. We're noticing that PS at the bottom of an email that has something like, if you're going to be at a trade show, then use that PS and say, PS, we'll be at booth number 1160. And we're finding, again, that it's amazing how some of these people are reading their PS. <laughs> now, one thing that's uh, changing a, a lot right now with salespeople, and uh, we do have that customer that likes to self-educate on their own. As I mentioned earlier, they come to us much later in the sales process. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be in contact with them. But the way we can be in contact with them is by nurturing. And what I'm saying, uh, you know, the new salesperson here, what they're doing is they're engaging them with content that is interesting. So instead of saying, you know, hi, I want to reach you, where are you, blah, 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 I'm going to say, here's a great company video about our solution. It's a two-minute video. Then a week later, I may say, here's a really cool infographic. Now, when I say infographic, it all goes under the word of what I call visual bling. And that is that this customer will stop everything to look at something interesting and colorful. And infographics are really the new rage. Uh, so if you show them an infographic that summarizes a 40-page white paper, they're going to want to see it visually or watch it in a video instead. And that's why video is going to be much, much stronger in the future as we move forward. Uh, we're going to also find that we'll be speaking with many of our prospects via video. It's really taking on uh, in terms of the new way of messaging. We're already seeing uh, some customers have webcams open where they're um, where their reps call them and they can see their reps. Or some of them are sending short video clips. So instead of saying you have mail, it says you have video and it's the rep maybe talking for a couple minutes. So again, this is the age of the visual piece. We want to always see our prospects. They want to see you. That's why it's really important on LinkedIn if anyone uh, wants to really polish up their profile, the first thing they should do is get a good picture. LinkedIn is not Facebook. You don't want a picture of yourself surfing on LinkedIn on a surfboard at the beach. You could have that on Facebook. But unless you're a surf instructor <laughs> on LinkedIn, you really don't want that as your main profile picture. So people, the visuals have become so, so important. 
And when we talk about you know sales in the future, we're also talking about texting. Uh, this is we're finding texting is becoming really a big piece in the sales process. This is an interesting text that I received uh, last year from a prospect who wanted to confirm that they received approval, uh, but that came through text. It did not come through email or the phone, but she went ahead and texted, congratulations, let's move forward. Uh, again, there's certain things you want to text and others you don't, uh, but this is becoming much more important in the channels, in the outreach channels. And I'm excited about that, that's for sure. And uh, I'm, I wrote a blog post just a couple days ago because we're definitely in the world of the selfies, right? Everybody's taking selfies now. Hillary Clinton, the Pope, Michelle Obama, you know, this is the new, and uh, I'm almost, my, the blog post I wrote was, you know, selfie is the new voicemail. And uh, there's just this fascination with this very personal way of taking a photograph of yourself. Well, wouldn't it be kind of interesting is this, as salespeople, we start, you know, sending a selfie. Uh, and this is, you know, I'm a big uh, sales futurist. I like to predict trends especially at the beginning of the year, I send out my trend reports. Everybody can get a copy of that, uh, Trends for 2014, and sort of our in and out list. But this is part of that, is what's, what's the future in sales? And, and I think we're all going to be paying attention to selfies a little more, uh, because really the goal is we've got to keep selling as smart as we can over and over and over. And, some of the techniques and ideas that I gave everybody today is really to hopefully increase sort of the smart selling piece. So um, I want to turn it over to Carrie. I want to see if some questions have come through. I want to be able to address some of those. So Carrie, how's it going? Very good. Um, okay, yes, we do have a question from Elizabeth. And she says, <laughs> do, you find that, do you find that many people on LinkedIn get their email outreach to their personal email versus their business email? Because she has found that people replied quickly to outreach, but then it seems to have slowed down dramatically. Interesting. Okay, yeah, Elizabeth, thanks for that question. And I think I, I'm understanding what you're saying. I, I highly recommend LinkedIn to be really kept in a personal, I'm sorry, in a professional light. Um, LinkedIn to me, I draw a very strong distinction on who I want to connect with on LinkedIn, who's going to be in my network, what email I'm going to give them, and it's all professional, professional, professional. I never mix the two. Uh, some people will say, uh, well, who do you accept on LinkedIn to, to you know, be a follower or whatever? And I say, only people that are going to advance your professional career. So for example, if I have, I do, I have a cousin who's been a stay-at-home mom for the past 10 years. She has four kids. She hasn't been in the work world for about 15 years. Love her to death. She's my cousin. Is she a good LinkedIn prospect? Actually, she's not because there really isn't anything that she's done that's going to advance my professional network. Um, she's a great Facebook person. I want to know about her kids, see pictures of her kids, talk with her all day about it, but she's not a good LinkedIn prospect. Someone that is a good LinkedIn prospect is, for example, I went to a conference just a couple weeks ago. It was Dreamforce here in San Francisco. Only 150,000 people go to that wonderful sales conference. Now, all the people that I met there, they did not have business cards. Uh, what did they have? Immediately they said, let's, let's LinkedIn with each other. That ex business cards were not even being exchanged. So that's how LinkedIn has become such a huge professional tool. Someone wants to see the voicemail tips slide again. Sure. Scott Absolutely. does. Absolutely. Yep. How many and how often should you leave a voicemail for a prospect? Great question. Uh, we get asked this a lot. Um, I, first of all, I would never leave more than three, maximum, over maybe a couple months' time. But I'm almost saying more than two at this point. We, my goal is if we have a really good one, we want to leave it. Uh, but we can leave more emails than voicemail. 
Uh, so a lot of times what I suggest to people is their first outreach is voicemail and email. Um, the second outreach could just be email alone. Third outreach, email alone. Uh, last outreach could maybe be both again. Okay. So that's sort of the formula that I recommend. Yes. Josie, this is Vicki. So one of the yeah. things that I'm, I'm finding in this current environment is that customers respond to text quicker mm. than anything else. So I don't yes. know if you have a perspective on that, but my recommendation, and I'm a stalker by nature, that's just who I am, right? <laughs> I'll admit to that. But I do find that um, when I have the customer's cell number and I text, I get a quicker response. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. I mean, I'm I'm really pleased to hear that, Vicki. And I, I really think this is happening more and more. And exactly like you're saying, um, we don't want to stock them. Um, but here's the deal: if if a customer has their cell number listed publicly, then it is actually okay for us to reach out to them via text. I don't know if I would do it as my first attempt. I would maybe think about doing it on my second. Um, but again, when I do it via text, I would have a very soft message such as, you know, hi, Bob, this is Vicki. I've tried reaching you. I'm excited to speak with you. You know, something really short. Um, and but it but you know Vicky you're saying you're a stalker you're also very brave you know because it is risky and it really depends on your customers um, Vicky you're also with Verizon so you are with a provider and you're kind of walking your talk you're saying we're all about the phone we're going to maximize our use of the phone uh, so texting is definitely that um, some of the people I'm training right now are a little worried about doing that piece, uh, but I don't think that's too far away, and I'm certainly not against it if it's done well. Okay. Thank you. And Corey would like to see the email slide again. Sure, sure. And then I have a question here from Michael of how do you integrate a referral into a voicemail or an email? Mm, great question. Um, I'm all about referrals. Um, I'm all about name dropping. I think that's one of the strongest ways for us to get attention, um, especially because this customer 2.0, they don't like to feel left out. That's another reason why they're so social. Uh, they will listen to their peers with a recommendation their peers will make before they listen to you. So I am all big on referral and name dropping. I highly recommend that it's, it's, if it's a strong referral, first of all, it's got to be an influential referral. We don't want a referral that's actually a negative referral. We want a referral that is seen in a good light and is highly respected and influential. So I want to add to that, it's got to be an influential referral not just a referral that says, I know Susie, she's in my business leads group, she met you eight years ago on a boat, and I'm calling you. You know, we don't want that. We want an influential referral, but I definitely recommend that being in the first sentence, on voicemail in the first sentence, on voicemail as well. Uh, so put it out there as fast as possible. Let's see, and Aaron would like a few suggestions for strong call to action on voicemail and email? Mm, great. Um, strong call to action really says, I'm going to be contacting you. It's not, well, you know, if you'd like to call me, I'm at. Or please, if there's any questions that I can answer, give me a call. Those are weak call to action. Strong call to action says, I will follow up next Thursday. Or uh, are you, you know, what's your availability for a call on Tuesday? So it's much more proactive, it's more aggressive, it's more direct, um, both on voicemail and email. Josiane, would you also, um, you know, suggest including the value proposition? I know when I was, um, you know, prospecting and in various sales positions, one of the things that I always left was what I could do for that customer. So what was my value proposition? What was my so what? What was, what was I going to do to enhance their business? You know, any thoughts on that? Absolutely. I mean, I call it same thing, you know, the what's in it for me, um, the value prop, why, why us, you know, why, why do customers rely on us? And I think on voicemail, it's really good to say, you know, uh, 
you know, customers rely on us for the past nine years. We've delivered this and this. It's that sort of what makes you different. What can you do for me? Uh, this is also good on email to include. Is to say, you know, 80% uh, of the Fortune 500 companies consistently rely on us for, and then the so what because we've been able to, you know, increase. So yeah, we need a little bit of that, most definitely. Um, uh, David wants to see the voicemail and email slide, mm -hmm. not the tips, but the one with the sure. blue background. Right. And Sue would like to know when it's appropriate to ask a prospect to Skype with you. Oh, love that question. Love it, love it, love it. You know, just like I talked about video. You know, what we're finding with the webcam and the Skype situation is um, a very interesting um, this is very interesting that's starting to happen, and that is that when the reps are aggressive about it, they get the prospects on board. So in other words, when the rep has a webcam that says, turn yours on, they will turn it on. But they will not be the first to do it. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's really saying, I, I, you know, I want to see you. I'm ready to see you. Are you ready to see me? So on the Skype piece, I definitely think that uh, requesting a Skype uh, appointment is a great way on sort of the first or second attempt. Um, I do think that they need to be warned about it, uh, not just, hey, turn on your Skype. But I also want to say that this customer 2.0 really likes to collaborate. They love collaboration. And what I mean by that is I mentioned earlier how connect rates continue to drop. And I also mentioned how we have such little time on the phone. Well, I highly recommend that when we are on the phone with them that we maximize that time. So why not pull in Skype while we're on the phone? So if I'm on the phone with John Smith and things are going well, I'm going to say, you know, John, I've got Skype open. I, I want to talk to you. And boom, within seconds, you've jumped over. And when you can make that leap from just that phone conversation to the face-to-face, -face, your, your response rate is going to be higher. Your conversion rate is going to be higher. I've got people that keep GoToMeeting open all the time. That's the tool we're using right now for this webinar. And same thing exactly is if they're explaining a difficult sort of configuration, they'll say to the customer, I just sent you a link while they're talking. Um, just click on that link. And before you know it, they've jumped on a meeting. That's one of the highest ways of you know, keeping that customer uh, occupied, ca capturing their attention, uh, elevating the conversation to a longer, more uh, important, higher level, and retaining those seconds and making, you know, really, really earning more time. I think that's really important because we just, I was trying to figure out how to pose this question, and I was going to pose it to everyone on our panel today. Um, it's from Joseph who's talking about, um, he says, relationship selling is so important in building the trust, but with, you know, texting and emailing and all of that, it's affecting, you know, the, you know, person, you know, the face-to-face -face relationship. And he's asking what the biggest challenges um, you think are being faced by sales reps. He's specifically talking about pharmaceutical sales reps um, due to the lack of time with people. And I think, you know, you just kind of hit on it. You kind of have to be on the, if you can get them at least on the phone and start talking to them and then in the middle of it go, you know, would you like to Skype or whatever, that helps. That may be the way to do it. What do you think? What does everybody think about that? I mean, this is Vicki. For me, I, the one of the things I would suggest is to always be relevant because if you're relevant, I'm going to make time for you, right? And so if you stay in front of the customer um, more than your competitor, the doors will open for you. And so you just have to, you know, it's a balance. And I'm sure Josie Ann has some great tips on it. But for me, it's about balancing the social media, the texting, the emailing. But nothing ever beats face-to-face. -face. And see, I get things done through people because I show up on the scene. I'm not relying on an email, a text message. I'm going to be at your door. And so I, I just think if you stay relevant and you always have that value proposition, 
someone is going to make time for you and, and that will care for itself. Thanks. Excellent point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think being relevant, I think this is a big, big word right now because, um, you know, customers really have absolutely no patience for someone that isn't relevant, um, someone that doesn't understand what's going on, someone that isn't smart. I mean, we, we because this customer is so much more educated than they ever have been, they've raised the bar on what they expect from their salespeople. And their salespeople, if they don't come in smart, uh, they're not going to stand a chance. So I absolutely agree with being relevant. And I think there's always a juggling act now because there are so many outreach efforts that phone and email alone are just not going to cut it. But having a good mix and having a, an outreach strategy that includes, you know, some Skyping as well as texting as well as voicemail and email, you know, um, and nurturing content, I mean, really having all of that in the mix. Now, you know, Vicki comes from uh, the background of show up and everything else will come together. I, I want to say that that's great, but I also want to remind everyone that we do have a customer that isn't granting meetings like they used to. So the days of us just showing up are not as popular as they were because this customer is elusive. They're here today and completely gone tomorrow. And I mean vanish gone. The one that said, hey, give me a call on Tuesday and we'll make it happen. And you call them on Tuesday and they're nowhere to be found. And a month goes by, two, three, four, they're completely gone. And then nine months later, they come back and say, oh, hi, hey, I'm ready to buy now. <laughs> exactly. So, this elusive customer is the one that we're trying to understand what they want. Exactly. That's true. That is funny how that happens. Um, I know Jeb Blunt, he calls it, you know, the sales gods. And if you make enough calls and, and try to, you know, touch someone through email or whatever, if you do it enough times and do it, you know, and try to connect with enough people, eventually the sales gods will rain down upon you and someone from four months ago will suddenly call you. <laughs> yes, I like that, the sales <laughs> nods. That's really good. Um, okay, there's someone... Let's see, there was one I just read from Suzanne. Can you comment on effective use of other social media tools such as Twitter for sales professionals? Yeah, I mean, I'm, we are big, uh, you can see our Twitter uh, handle there. And I feel like Twitter is without a doubt a great tool. It's a great research tool, uh, especially if you program uh, your, pro your um, solution to find out what other people in the market are saying. Uh, I also think it's really good to follow thought leaders because you can always get some great content. And when I mentioned earlier about nurturing your prospects, you pick up some great content and you turn it over to these, some of your prospects and you say, hey, here's a new study. Well, you didn't know about that new study because, unless you had read that tweet. So I do think that Twitter is really, really gaining importance. And I've even found as leads that all have someone that will tweet out something that says, hey, we're looking for a sales trainer. And all they did was tweet it out. They never went on LinkedIn. They never sent an email. But they did it on purpose because they said, we only want a sales trainer that is socially savvy. And unless they pick up our tweet about it, you know, but we didn't pick it up unless we had programmed, you know, inside sales training, which is what we do, to, to grab that sort of request. So I think uh, Hootsuite is our platform that we use for Twitter. Uh, it helps us program a whole dashboard where we can monitor everything. So I highly recommend as salespeople that we really get to know it and use it. Excellent. 